Image and perception is my topic. Uh, it's the way I see it. It's how your eyes perceive something. Uh, visually, we see things, but the perception part of us is built on our, our memories, what we've been taught, our experiences. Several years ago, uh, I was at a local, with a local historical society. And a uh, portion of the talk was about the Virginia Indians south of the James River. I was the first presenter, and after my pre presentation, an older lady, she was 92 years old, she had been a school teacher, and she told the audience that Indians had no agriculture until the Europeans arrived. Uh, Indians did not know how to raise food and farm. They hunted and collected berries. And everyone looked at me, and because I respect my elders, I just simply smiled and said, she's 92. And we left it at that. The unfortunate side of that is that she taught her students that misinformation. Perception and images, our discussion is influenced by our discussion of images and what we see is influenced by the norms, the practices, and the interactions of a particular time. Formulating a fresh perspective on the history of Virginia's native people requires re-examination and deciphering of history from the myriad of post-contact written contact co accounts that we find in the various repositories of historical knowledge. The source documents that we have access to are written accounts for the most part from the point of view of the person who has something to gain from portraying Native Americans in a certain way. We find that much of the history of Virginia Indians has been overlooked, misinterpreted, or merely follows the standard way of discounting Native Americans as a primitive people who did not know how to use their abundant assets. The earliest depictions of the appearance of the purported lifestyle of indigenous people were recorded by European artists and illu illustrators. John White is probably the most famous. In the late 1500s, 1585, he was the contributor, the painter that did many of the, did the paintings that the engravings for this first document that was presented to entice newcomers to the, to the new world. His depictions are very stylized and it shows a paradise with bountiful riches. The problem with this is that we don't look at it as for what it is. It is a marketing piece. It is a real estate developer's book. And it was simply to promote the new colony, which now is where North Carolina is located, but it does cover the Atlantic coast. But it does not explain the vastness of the native population and the intricate commerce and sociopolitical systems that existed within the native world. Along with the illustrations, the narrative written about the native population reinforces the concept of manifest destiny and the opportunity to save the primitives. Harriet's book uses descriptive phrases as barbarous, deprived of the knowledge of God, misguided people taught by nature to wor worship their chiefs after death. Spirit of the Lord has suggested to these uncultivated men a method by which they can construct things necessary for their use. So basically, it was just happenstance almost the Native Americans could live. What came out of this early depiction of Native, the Native population we all know, we can fast forward just a little bit to 1619 and what was already happening to the native population. It was a clash of cultures, disruption of lifestyle, loss of oral tradition, disease, aggression, manipulation, greed, confusion, removal to the islands, slavery, death. We can go on and on and on. 
I think most of you in, in the room are, are teachers or look forward to being a teacher one day. And I'd like to encourage you to go back and look at source documents and glean a real story from them. You have to think of primary source sources um, like a movie. And a textbook is a summary of that movie, something you hear from a friend. And while your friend might give great detail and tell you how great the movie is, it's not the same as seeing it yourself. So there's parts that you might notice in a different way. Even looking at these old paintings and engravings from the early late 1500s, there's a different way, there's an embedded message within these depictions. And our other panelists, we're going to talk about those a little bit more. But with that, I'd like to ask for volunteers to tell me what are the, the three things you wrote that you'd like to see on a Virginia Native American monument? Anybody? Yes. One section. I'm going to have a floater mic. You'll do it. Okay. Hello. I would like to see the uh, Native American fully clothed with the beautiful uh, uh, feather. Oh, I don't know how you call that. The the band of feathers. So, the, so some head headdress. Headdress, headdress, right, and fully clothed okay. in the Indian uh, garment. Not like that guy up there, in other no. words. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'm sorry. I actually have a comment. Um, okay. I was wondering, and I've heard this a couple of times, um, that. Native Americans don't necessarily like to be called Native Americans, more of Native people. Native, and how do you feel? Native like people, First People, American Indians, Native American Indians, <laughs> all those variations. Now, I'm not away. Not away. Okay. Okay. So, Karen is Monica. Okay. Okay. So, we do identify by our particular. Mm -hmm. um, tribal definition, yes. also linguistically. Mm -hmm. I'm an Iroquoian right. person. Karen is a Suan speaker. They, these were our enlist linguistic groups. Okay. Now, obviously, we speak English now, mm -hmm. but if we had to go back historically, you know. So all of those, you look in, yeah. in Washington, it's the, the National Museum of the American Indian. Okay. And we could go on about how that happened. You all know how the ID, the ID of American yes. Indian happened. Yes. But I guess at this point, it's something we have to live with. Right. Okay. I was just wondering that. Sorry, it was yeah. kind of off topic, but. So, no, it's a good, good. Is there anyone else? Three things. Okay. I would like to see more than just men. So women and children, and more than just one representation of what a Native American's traditional dress and, and appearance is. So Native Americans include Inuit and other um, Pacific Coast people, um, people who live all over the North American continent. Thank you. Again, yep. I'm, I'm going to talk about it from my Caribbean kind of background because what, I guess we got enough of American uh, movie of Red Indian that this is what comes to mind, that this is a caricature, that that's in terms of, you know, um, the strength, the, you know, ready to hunt like people do no, no, no other thing. And they, I know that some uh, Native American, they live in cold areas, so they are, have 
clothes, layers and layers of clothes and, and so on that are, that are woven and, and you don't get that here. So if this just represents the iconic Native American or Red Indian, it's misleading and to me insulting. Okay, thank you. I think we have a theme with the clothes. You know, it seems to be that's consistent. Okay, here. Okay. Okay, say that again. Oh, sure. Um, I would like to see something that acknowledges a history of mixed race peoples. Again, anyone else? Three things that you would like to see on the Native American monument. Uh, how how y'all doing today? Um, thank y'all for coming, uh, first and foremost. Thank you. I already asked for permission to speak for my elders. I got permission earlier. You did. Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to see more depictions that, uh, of the Olmec ancestry. Um, we have the, I have the understanding after reading certain books that the Olmecs had a lot of influence culturally uh, in regards to the Americas in general. And um, I guess I want to be more spe specific in uh, regards to the mounds in Ohio that resemble the step pyramids of, of, uh, of Dozier. I like to see more of the connection between the, the, the old world and the old new world, I guess you can okay. say. Okay. I'll take one more. I've got to move on. We have three more presenters here, but quick. Um, a, a quick clarification. The, the sculpture that you're speaking of will go where? It's going on the grounds of the Capitol. Now, it's not a sculpture just yet. Mm -hmm. the, the, we're in the final stages of deciding exactly what this commemoration will look like. Okay. So there is probably multiple images that will be included. But what I want to hear are, you know, thoughts from... I would like to see a representation of the three sisters of corn, squash, and beans. Okay. I would like to see a representation of the three sisters of corn, squash, and, and beans. beans. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We'll come back to this question, but I, I, in fairness, I want to move this forward. So, Dr. Wiggins. Good afternoon, my name is Bill Wiggins, and I'm <clears throat> trying to get my mind and mouth in gear, getting the afternoon droops like everybody. You all are ready to go to sleep. I'll try not to put you all to sleep. As we've been talking about images of Native American Indians, I've been thinking about images of Africans. We need to include that as we go forward, because we do have certain notions of what Africans look like. Am I right? When they arrived here, almost all of you probably think, as I'm thinking, in terms of an image of those Africans arrived, what do you conjure up in your mind? What did they look like? What would you think they looked like when they arrived? And you see depictions of them. What comes to mind immediately? Pardon? Nudity. Nudity. Chains. Chains. So we need to work on that too. Uh, I was just thinking about that as we were working through this as we move forward to 2019. I hope to be around in 2019. Hope everyone here will be around in 2019 uh, so we can uh, celebrate that quadrennial. Um, I'm looking at things from somewhat of a different perspective. I thought it was important that um, we look at imagery of Africans as well and also uh, parallel, if you will, some of the experiences of Native American Indians. Uh, I am going to be brief. I entitled the, uh, my presentation, Juxtaposition and Parallels or Parallelism, Native American Indians and Africans in uh, British Colonial North America. Imagery and the history of Native American Indians and Africans in British Colonial North America share many parallels when juxtaposed. And this reality will be looked at briefly, chronologically, and descriptively. Um, in looking at this, I said, what happened when Europeans encountered um, Africans and Native American Indians? And I did that to try to figure out why they ended up being derogated, that is, Africans and Native American Indians, in the way that they ultimately were, and why they ended up uh, 
being enslaved, that is Africans, and efforts to enslave Native American Indians. And um, I thought that perhaps when they first encountered, that is, uh, Europeans, Native American Indians and Africans, maybe it was a matter of ethnocentrism. They looked different, right? They dressed differently, they ate different things, they spoke a different language. But then I also thought about the old reality is that to the victors goes the spoils. If you can conquer them, they must be weak, correct? And then you try to force them to change their ways. And we can go back to antiquity and look at uh, conflict between human beings, you know, contact, conflict, etc. But moving into our discussion here, and we've looked at race and racism, I ask myself the question, why, if it was a matter of needing labor, and uh, I'm sure you've looked at that in the new old world, and I call it the new, new old world. And uh, Chief Austin, was, she tapped me when she said Native American Indians, and I just wanted to go back for a second. I say Native American Indians because having spent time out in Minnesota with uh, Russell Means and Wazaduta and other individuals, medicine men, uh, a number of them, such as members of the American Indian Movement, say we are, again, American Indians. We don't like Native American because anyone born in the United States is a native, so they're Native Americans. And many of the urban Indians consider themselves to be Native Americans, so I want to be ready to deal with anyone. So I say, Native American Indians. I, I cover everyone, and I cover my cousin, too, who was Toussaint, who was part of the longest march from Wounded Knee, South Dakota, in 1973, to the Statue of Liberty, a bunch of us Cherokees, if you will. But back to the point I was trying, trying to, to make earlier. We know that both groups of individuals will be derogated quite readily by Europeans when they came into contact with them. And most of you are familiar with Winter, Winthrop Jordan's work, White Over Black, Georgian Fredrickson, et cetera, uh, Black Image in the Right, White Blind, et cetera. And um, we can go back to the writings of William Shakespeare, Othello, the swarthy, dirty, Moor, because slavery originally, as you know, was not, or enslavement based upon the color of your skin. We can go back to the Roman Latin Fundi. We can go back as far as we want to, if you will, but ultimately became based upon the color of one's skin. We do know that. So the writings of Shakespeare and notions of, of uh, darkness, of course, you can even think about Manichaeanism, you know, evil versus good, and good is always what? White, bad is always black, except for black stallion and things like that. There are some other, there's some exceptions to that. But getting to uh, British colonial North America, we know that as uh, Robert Burkhoff has pointed out, the Native American Indians, the noble savage, if you, you will, um, they ultimately were viewed as being a weak race because many of them were dying off. You know why they were dying off, correct? Different disease environments. And um, they examined the, their physicality. They did everything they possibly could to say that they were a weak race. And um, the same sort of thing, uh, was attempted initially when it came to Africans because they were deemed to be inferior. Um, they really had no culture, no background. We've had a lot of discussion concerning what Africa did contribute to uh, the knowledge of the world. And Egypt was always in Africa, we know that. The whole of Africa at one time was known as Ethiopica. And Chancellor Williams and Shea Diop and others have written and documented clearly the contributions of Africans to the world throughout history. Herodotus actually wrote about them, the black and curly haired individuals. We can go on and on and on, so I think that we don't have to argue that anymore. We know the Africans were not living as wild individuals, shrinking heads, cannibals, and so on, and uh, my colleague here will point out that they said the same thing about Native American Indians. They were eating one another, you know, cutting them up, putting them in pots, <laughs> and things like that. Um, and even when it came to scalping, we know the scalping, uh, that. that in Europe, too, and in Africa. I mean, nothing to brag about, but it was a way of also getting you yourself paid, as we know, in the early period of American history. But when it came to Africans, we know that um, many of them were not dropping like flies when they got to the New Old World. I changed that, too. I don't like New World because uh, North America, South America, Latin America, Central America, it all existed, same time that, uh, as far as I know, Europe existed, unless you want to look at plate tectonics and everything slid, slid, slid apart. So, but that's insulting to say that something started to exist because a bunch of people came over and said, okay, now you exist. You get my point here. 
So I call it the new old world. We know that uh, many of the explorers, the white indentured service, et cetera, they were dying, and it wasn't necessarily because it was so hot. I mean, they didn't have as much melanin as the Africans. We know that. That provides some protection from sunburn. But Africans, dark people burn, sunburn, get sunburned too. I've gotten sunburned uh, quite a few times myself. But I, mean, I just wanted to establish that. But we know that many of the Africans who were brought over and enslaved, a number of them had the sickle cell trait which provides some protection from Plasmodium falciparum, or malaria or yellow fever. And so they weren't dying at the same rate as many of the whites who came over, the explorers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we know the quinine obviously was used to try to take care of malaria, et cetera. My question has always been, well, um, why didn't uh, the Europeans say that we're a weak race since we're, we're kind of dying off. Now, there was pseudoscience to it, too. They thought that God had, what, put the Africans on the face of the earth to do all the work. And that's why they were living longer. But you know, that's preposterous. Uh, again, pseudoscience had, of course, uh, uh, its development early on. But as I said, why didn't they say that we're a weak race? Well, because they already had the concept and believed that they were superior anyway, correct? And so the same was applied that is, that pseudoscience to the Native American Indians as it was to, to Africans. Um, let me continue by indicating that um, in terms of some of the parallels, we know ancestor worship, revering the elders, Africans, Native American Indians, correct? Spiritualism, uh, we can even go back to animism if we want to. Uh, there's some spirituality there. Obviously, there are differences. And in many regards, and there are exceptions, the Africans uh, didn't immediately start attacking the Europeans when they showed up in their geographic area. Uh, we know that uh, the Spaniards had a hard time, right? Uh, in, in Jamestown and elsewhere, there were some Native American Indians who said, we don't want you here. They realized very, very early on uh, that uh, they had um, some uh, other ideas. Another irony in all of this, though, or an irony in all of this is that Early on, these pseudoscientists said that maybe these Africans and, and Indians, uh, maybe they have these problems. They're not, uh, again, ever going to be our equals because of uh, environmental reasons. Uh, later on, that would be turned around. Am I correct? It would be based upon heredity. You know about Shockley, Jensen, Hernstein, and all those individuals. It's just so ironic that uh, those people were using an environmentalist argument in a racist way and then later on to have the heredity argument to be used in a racist way, saying that, you know, bad gene pool, et cetera. I don't want to get too far uh, astray from that. But going back further, we can, can look at song, we can look at dance, we can look at uh, chants, et cetera. But I just want to stress again the epidemiological factors that I looked at momentarily that uh, led individuals to view Native American Indians and, and Africans in, in certain ways, though again, it was reversed. Um, when it came to, to further derogation, we had uh, individuals like our so, one of our so-called founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, you know, his notes on Virginia. If you ever get a chance, read those notes on Virginia. Uh, they were upsetting to me, what, 1784, I think, uh, talking about Africans, they secrete, secrete more by the glands than by the mind, but you know, uh, obviously, um, he liked himself from Sally uh, Hemings, <laughs> so I'm, you know, well, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be funny, except that you know, that's the reality. You can't have it both ways, but I guess he did. Um, uh, if we go further along, and I'm going to, to stop here because there are other ways that we can, can, can look at this. Uh, keep in mind that uh, both groups provided quite a bit of information in terms of cultivation, the strains of tobacco, yams, etc. And we know about Native American Indians and even Strawberry Banks. Why do they call it Strawberry Banks? Where the Veterans Hospital is? When the Kikatan Indians were? When the part of the Jamestown bunch showed up? And I mean that that way, you know, they were looking for gold and silver and, and the Jamestown bunch, you know, that I give them credit for helping get America started, but I don't like the way they got it started, obviously. I'm a little biased there for obvious reasons. But they, you know, they, they fed them with strawberries and things like that, so they, they knew how to grow something, right? They were good for something. Actually, they made, I mean, even the pilgrims, you know the story there. But you don't 
look at the whole story about what happened to the Indians. He took advantage of them, need I say more. And um, stereotypes, they just continue, they're still with us. Um, again, uh, sometimes individuals help promote stereotypes. I'm going to be egalitarian here and objective in my presentation. That's why I'm always talking to my daughters and my son is old enough to know better now. But um, we know that uh, in those movies, you ever see those westerns? I used to hate that. I guess I was, something was wrong with me as a younger person when I went there and the Native American Indians, they were all whooping up, running around crazily and the wagon trains and everybody was cheering when the soldiers, they opened up the back of the curtains on the wagon trains, shot down all the Indians and uh, that, 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 that irritated me quite a bit. Um, and, but looking at reality once again, there was always the stereotypical stuff about what happened uh, when uh, uh, the United States Army, when it was during the Indian Wars, when there was a, a clash, of course, the soldiers were always talking about how they were mutilated, their bodies were torn apart, etc. And General George Armstrong Custer, I'm convinced he shot himself because he believed that he would be mutilated, etc. But they don't say anything about the Native American Indians how the soldiers were cutting them up, making little purses and things out of their skin. And I mean, things are just so misrepresented, but there are those parallels, and we can bring it right down to today. And uh, some of those images, you know, Amos and Andy, you know, Step It, Fetch It, I mean, I have all those buffoonish things that, that one can see, even Amos and Andy, with all due respect to JJ and them, and good times, even some of those things. So there are many parallels, and there are some, some unfortunate aspects to fire water, as we call it, alcohol, and certain things bring it right down to today. We know who, who provided a lot of that stuff. And um, I dare say, I mean, I'm being president, presidentist, I suppose, if I speak about drugs and, and who uh, gets busted and who doesn't get busted and who's bringing stuff in and who's not bringing stuff in. But I don't want to get too political here. But, um, the bottom line is they shared many experiences, negatively speaking, Native American Indians and uh, Africans in America and subsequently African Americans. And um, we can talk further about this as we, as we um, have other presentations. But uh, I think there's clearly a, a, a mixed heritage here. And of course there was intermarriage and so on. There's so much I want to say, but I think I've said enough went longer than I wanted to, perhaps. So thank you. Okay, next. Okay. Thanks. I'm, uh, my name is Drew Lopenzina, and I am uh, brand new here, working at Old Dominion University. Uh, I've only been here for a few weeks, and I was very happy to be invited to this conference, uh, sort of in, sh in short notice. But we've learned a lot here, I think. Um, we've learned things that are going to subtly sh you know, shift the way that we understand this dynamic of what's happening in the year 1619 and before and beyond. And, uh, and all of this is valuable, and we'll take it home with us. I'm going to approach this from a, a literary studies point of view. Um, I teach literature, early American literature, and Native American literature. And, and, and so I'm interested in the idea of, of stories. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Thomas King, who uh, traces his descent back to the Cherokee and, and to Greeks, uh, says that um, the truth about stories is that's all we are. And I think what he means by that is that stories define us. We're defined by our personal stories and our experience, experiences, but we're also defined by our, our larger cultural stories and the stories that that culture tells about us. And a lot of a lot of that cultural storytelling, it takes place in narratives, it takes place in these old texts from the 16th century that Lynette is showing us. It also happens in images though, and images are, are images tell stories in ways that uh, perhaps stick with us uh, more profoundly and, and more, we internalize them more than we know. This is a uh, painting by N.C. Wyeth, a famous illustrator, uh, painter and illustrator, who, who did a lot of these sort of Last of the Mohegan paintings. I think people can look at a painting like this and say, that, that's actually a, a flattering painting of, of a beautiful specimen of a male. Uh, 
beautifully painted. What's wrong with images like this? And it's, it's a fair question to ask something like that. But it's the, uh, the multitude of, of such images as they compile over time uh, where whenever we see images of Native Americans, and this, goes, this, goes, this has a, a very long history, we tend to see them in isolation. We tend to see the lone, isolated male warrior in the headdress. And this comes back to Lynette's question of, of what do we do with a monument, because certainly uh, when we do see a statue, and I don't have any pictures here of statues or, or, or monuments of, of natives, but again, we, we'd be likely to see that lone male on horseback, perhaps, with, a, with the headdress. And, and these images, uh, they, they actually erase something. They erase the idea that, that Native people actually had community. They had families. They, they had domestic lives. Uh, it, it plays into a, a motif that, that has famously been referred to as, I'm going to just skip over that one. Well, we see also the, you know, not just the, the noble savage, so to speak, but the, 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 the vicious savage of performing acts of atrocity, all of these things are memorialized. But it all plays into this idea, ultimately, of the, the image of the vanishing native. This is a famous Edward Curtis photograph from the end of the 19th century. And the idea that natives were, were disappearing from the scene. If we see them at all, it's in isolation. They're on their way out. Um, they won't be here long because native people aren't supposed to be part of this, this modern, civilized uh, world that, that Europeans brought over here in the early uh, 1700s and 17th century in this part of the world and, and started to create. Um, and, and this just goes on. We see natives in our advertising, uh, sports icons, you guys know all this. And romance as well. This is, there's a blooming industry of uh, romance novels that, that play on these sort of motifs. Savage Eden, I don't know what that means. Um, but it sounds good, or it looks good from the picture, I guess. These images go back a long ways. Uh, we're looking at some present day images, but even the earliest images of native people uh, are performing very similar tricks. If you go back to, this is an early 17th century illustration, and you could split this thing right down the middle. This is supposed to be uh, Amerigo Vespucci discovering America. And if you look at it closely, the symbolism of this and how it's laid out, everything on this side is meant to represent civilization. Everything on this side is meant to represent savagery, uh, the lack of civilization, the absence of civilization. So we have Vespucci, he's carrying his astrolabe, uh, which represents the, the height of technology of this era, which allowed these great ships to sail across the oceans. He's got the sword, he's, got the, he's in the act of claiming the land for Europeans. He's got the flag, he's got the cross, he's got all the accoutrements of conquest. Uh, on the other side we have the native woman. And America is often represented as a, an exotic, naked, dark-skinned woman. Maybe like the picture in the, uh, the, the pamphlet or the, the, the program. And, and she's prone, whereas, whereas Vespucci is, is standing erect. Uh, all the natives are closer to the ground. They're close to these, these exotic-looking animals here. And if you look closely in the background, they're having a little barbecue here. There's a, a leg on the spit. They're, they're, they're I guess, eating themselves. Um, and this is a common motif as well. Um, and you're going to see this, we, we project this, we think of maps, for instance, and, and maps are images too. Maps are supposed to be neutral, objective, uh, relayers of information, but of course they also project values and, and, and ideologies. Uh, this is from the 1534, uh, Sebastian uh, uh, Munster, I believe, made this map. In 1534, when people were thinking about America, we're awfully ethnocentric. Uh, we think of America as this place up here, but that was hardly even a blip on the map at that point. When people thought about America back then, they were thinking about this area right here. And they were projecting their values on this in terms of what America was for them, but also in terms of, of who inhabited that area. If you look at the lower left-hand corner of that image, you're going to see the native people again. Uh, naked, they've got their... Uh, well, they've got, again, on the chopping block, human bodies, and, and there seems to be sort of no moral agency here. It's just all uh, slash and tear, and, and I don't know. There's no, there's no thinking going on in all of this. It's hard for us to separate ourselves from centuries of images like this. We've been inundated with these images. This is a, unfortunately, that's not very clear, uh, but this is an image that Abenaki historian Lisa Brooks put together. Uh, that just tries to get us to imagine what did, what did this native space, the American continent, look like 
when you take all of that cultural, all of these cultural projections off of it, and if you erase all of the writing that we've superimposed upon it, what did it look like? And, and for Lisa Brooks, at least, you can't really see it as well as I'd like you to, but, but it would be a, a network of waterways that connect kinship uh, uh, peoples and kinships and trade networks. And, and this was what America, perhaps, at least a, a different way of trying to conceptualize what America might look like from an indigenous perspective. It's hard for us to take away all that, that, that writing, all of that, that history making and image making that we've done. However, uh, America is not the place that we've been told it is. Somebody mentioned earlier the mounds in Ohio. This would be, uh, this is an artist representation of Cahokia, and, and I asked this the other day when I gave this presentation, but how many of you have heard of Cahokia? Okay, and a few. Usually I ask that question in a room. It's not always a room full of scholars on, on this topic, but usually nobody has ever heard of this. And, and Cahokia is, is this, was a, this was a civilization from the 11th century to about the 14th century, roughly around that time period. This was located in the area of what is today St. Louis. It was a, a hub of sorts, an indigenous hub, this was probably a city of about 20,000 people. Uh, at least that's the, the, the most optimistic estimate of how large that city could have been. Uh, if so, that would have been larger than any city in Europe at the time. To support 20,000 people, you would need a great deal of agriculture. Uh, not only did they have this agriculture, they had enough uh, surplus agriculture to, to, to uh, trade all over the, uh, the North American continent, and they traded with other mound building communities, this was known as Mississippian culture. Most of us don't know anything about this. It's, it's been erased from our history. We don't, we don't learn this in school. Uh, we don't think of native people as having a civilization in North America. And, and, and our images erase it as well. However, if you were to drive through this area even today, you know, people living 20 miles away from this place don't even know it exists, but the, the, the visual image, the visual evidence is, is still there. John White in the 1580s gave us these, these representations of native peoples. It's very interesting. These are different from the images that we're used to, the, the images I showed you earlier in the program, uh, probably because these tropes hadn't really been established yet. John White is sort of starting, uh, he, he's one of the first people to represent indigenous peoples of North America for us, and, 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 and he had his own sort of unique way of doing that. Uh, this would have been from the Roanoke colony. I want to bring this all home now. Uh, when people start, when, when Europeans start coming to America, North America, uh, when English people, I should say, in the 16, early 1600s, uh, they, are, they are utterly reliant on the native people for agriculture. We're always told that native people, were, they don't grow agriculture, they live in the forest, they hunt for deer, and they forage for wild berries and whatnot. We know better, I think, now. At least I hope we know better. But we, we don't often see it in images like this. I mean, this image shows us, you know, f flowing uh, fields of corn. It shows us a village surrounded by a fort. Uh, these are, John White was a, an eyewitness to these things. But we don't, we don't tend to think this. The reason we don't think it is because we've been told otherwise over and over again. And the images of, of native braves in isolation don't tell us this particular story. Uh, if we were to read from a... Uh, Robert Cushman from Mort's Relation, who tells us of the native people there, they are not industrious, neither have art, science, skill, or faculty to use either the land or the commodities thereof. Uh, Cushman, uh, Edward Winslow, William Bradford describes for us a people who didn't have science, who didn't have agriculture. They weren't supposed to have fields like this. Ironically, at the same time, they were utterly reliant on native surplus agriculture. They would have died without it, and, and they knew that. And they, they sought native people out in order to get that excess corn, uh, by hook or by crook, I should say. Usually by crook. And that takes us to this guy right here, Mr. John Smith. Pocahontas. We have taken this complex story, this cultural story that we've been telling, and this is how we've sort of, we've, we've, we've reduced it to this little kernel of a romance between these two figures that, that came together uh, sometime around 1608. And, and somehow it's become a love story with them. You've all seen the movie. You know how it plays out. We grow up with this story. Um, it's a love story. And, and I guess that's the way we, we like to think of it. It is a more complicated story than that, however. Uh, and, 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 and in a way, the love story that, that Disney tells us and so many other movies and, and productions of this story has told us 
is covering the real history of it. The real history, the story that we don't tell ourselves, the story that we've left out, is that this is a story of violence, it's a story of coercion, it's a story of captivity. Pocahontas, as a young girl, um, was captured by Samuel Argyll uh, around 1613. Uh, she was lured to the water's edge, she was lured aboard his ship, and she was held captive there. This is not a romance, this is a captivity story. She was held captive by the, the Jamestown people for almost two years in order to coerce Powhatan to, to do their bidding and, and to, to go along and, and trade with them. It's during that time while she's in captivity that she actually marries John Rolfe. Um, and we could think about, you know, why would she make a decision like that? I mean, she has something to gain now, which is her own freedom, of course. Uh, she also, during this time, is baptized into Christianity. Again, we'd like to think that this was a, a willing thing, perhaps. It's certainly, this is part of the story, our national story. The, the baptism of Pocahontas is a painting by John Chapman that hangs in the Capitol Rotunda. We like to think of this as part of our national narrative, perhaps. It's, it doesn't make it into the Disney movie, maybe. But, uh, but, but at the same time, again, this is a story of coercion, not of, of, of Christian first fruits, I think. Let me rush to the end of this. Pocahontas marries John Rolfe. She goes to England uh, largely as a promotional um, endeavor to gain money for the colony. And she dies there, and she never comes back. Her, her bones are still in a, in a graveyard somewhere in in Gravesend, England. John Rolfe, however, does come back. John Rolfe, through his marriage to Pocahontas, has inherited land. Also, interestingly enough, it's John Rolfe who develops for the colony the first successful strain of tobacco, which is going to be the cash crop of the Virginia colony. Historians do not know, I may be going out on a limb here with all you historians in the room, historians do not know how John Rolfe, who was a nobody really, had no experience that we know of, he was a commoner, uh, how did John Rolfe develop this marketable strain of Virginian tobacco? Uh, people speculate it was this Trinidadian tobacco that he somehow got a hold of that the Spaniards were growing down south. What people discount is the fact that John Rolfe was married to Pocahontas. He had entered into a kinship network. He was given land. He had lived on that land for a certain amount of time, for about a year. And that may, perhaps it was native knowledge and, 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 and the, the native ability, the indigenous knowledge of the crops of the land and how to grow them and how to treat them, that, that gave John Rolfe the knowledge to be able to grow this tobacco, which made him rich and made the colony rich. Uh, it didn't do much for the native people. And it also created the conditions, because tobacco is such a labor-intensive crop to grow, that we needed to bring more people over here to grow it, to work the fields, to dry it. And of course, that brings us to slavery in America. And it is, fact, in fact, John Rolfe, who is involved in, in the purchase, and, and is the person who actually records the purchase, of those first 20 and some odd negars, as it says on the bill of lading, lading uh, that begins slavery to get its foothold in North America. This is a complicated story. It's a story that, that, that touches all of us, that has implications for all of us, and it's a story that we have buried in this very simple Disney romance. This is the story we tell of a romance, but it, it's a story actually of slavery, exploitation, and the usurpation of indigenous land. And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I know we have another talk that we have to hear. Thank you. I gave you, I, I mentioned another question, the one about the three women. I ask you all to write down your impressions of this particular uh, depiction of the three women. It's on the front of your program, program book. But uh, do we have some comments about your feelings, your impressions, your thoughts about this particular image? Now, yesterday, we had a lively crowd who really had a lot to say about this.
I'll get you started because I'm the one who wrote the blog post about this image that appears on the 1619 website. So um, I wanted to throw in there a little background that this image was drawn as part of a series of, I uh, can't remember if they're woodcuts or pen and ink drawings, to illustrate um, a, basically a travelogue that was written by a man who went um, to South America to help put down slave rebellions. And his experience actually causes him to start to think that the institution of slavery that is developing in the Americas is a bad thing. And so the, the travelogue and the images originally have an anti-slavery take. And the publisher makes them tone it back to celebrate colonialism. So um, you can read these images through some pretty interesting lenses about the debate and dissension over the validity of the institution of slavery and its relationship to Christianity and to um, men's depiction of women. Um, these women are definitely quite sexy, right, and attractive. So I wanted to pitch it off there is how might that change our interpretation of this picture? Um, Stephanie, thank you. It is William Blake the poet, is it not, or is it not? It is the William Blake the, for for English folks. Um, so, to me, that was the most uh, impressive thing immediately because I'm an English professor, and I I was surprised when I realized it was Blake, though I'd seen many Blake engravings, and um, he was a you know, very spiritual person. He saw visions um, and uh, a wonderful artist, but also a very great poet. Um, Puritan, I believe. Um, was he a Puritan? Not a Puritan? Well, I thought he was just kind of crazy. I mean, schizophrenic. I thought he was quite religious too. Okay. 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 Anyway, um, so when I see it, I think this is the same guy who, you know, Little Lamb who made thee and Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Um, so that was my impression. I'll let somebody else talk. Hello. I think um, the most important thing that I see when I first look at the picture is the hair of all three women. If you notice, the white woman's hair is wrapped around her, like all the way down to her thigh. And I think that's kind of like hierarchical because the Indian woman's hair would have been, I mean, just as long as the white woman's hair would have been. And then the African woman's hair is the shortest. Um, and though it would have grown outwards, it still probably would have been longer than it's depicted in a photo. So I think that's very intentional as far as like a beauty hierarchy, and that's kind of what I noticed when I first look at the painting. Well, I would say that, that, that the hair, you know, the African women at the time who appeared, sometimes they had no hair, you know, so I don't think that it's the hair that got me. I think it's the sexuality of the, the exposure of women's bodies and the privilege of men. I mean, say, Blake, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the middle of the night, what immortal hand or eye did frame thy cemetery, right? Fair, right, fearful cemetery. So it seems to be very religious, you know, what created it. But in a sense, all these men were repressed in terms of their sexuality as well. And when they got the occasion, they sort of frame things and use women's bodies in ways that we today are very kind of outraged about. But I think we should interrogate that, whether it's a Native American woman or I, I, don't, I, I see women here. I see gender. I see the privilege of men 
to use women's bodies for whatever it is, whether it's abolition, because he got this from Stedman. The, the, you know, the, the, there was a you know, Dutch colony where things were happening, and these depictions of women were very much framed in that context of Dutch, where there were Maroons who you know, went to the woods, but there were also Africans who, in fact, were Creole. You know, the bridge between European and African was happening. So I think we have to think in terms of both the history and in terms of the Victorian, you know, sexually repressed men that then continue to use women's bodies as framing their own repressed sexuality. Wow. I just wanted to add that Puritans weren't sexually repressed. Um, thank you. I noticed how the, uh, I also noticed how the hair is covering the, uh, the white woman's genitals. It's supposed to depict her, her chastity. It's supposed to show that she's more chaste than the other two women. Um, the other two are more exposed. The Native American woman, her stance is more uh, gaped than the other two. Um, also, the, the picture is entitled Europe Supported by Africa and America. And it does show how uh, the African woman and the Native American woman are guiding the white woman and also giving her support. Okay. Um, my name is Angela Hendricks, and I'm a computer science major. Okay. You want to give your name, babe? Oh, okay. My name is Ashley Washington. I'm from the College of William & Mary. I just want to support our young people here. Okay, I'm going back here. Kathy Jackson, Mass Common Journalism, Norfolk State. Not a student. Thank you to all of you for your comments. We'll probably come back to this. But Ms. Wood is ready for our next uh, presentation. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Wood. I'm a member of the Monacan Indian Nation, and I'm delighted to be here today. I always say that educators and students are my favorite audience because you allow us to reach people exponentially. Every time I talk to one of you, you can go out and spread the word, and it's sort of like proselytizing in a way, um, getting back at some of our ancestors who did the same, I guess. Anyway, um, I'm going to read my talk because I'm trying to get across a lot of really intense ideas in a very small space of time. And I have a few slides for you, but the document that I've come up with is called Past Silences. And it relates to everything that all of our previous panelists have talked about uh, in terms of the way that we portray history through words in addition to the images that we've been talking about. And I wanted to point out, too, that when I arrived at my hotel room on Thursday night, I immediately looked at the guidebook that was supposed to tell us how glorious this area is and why we should run out and spend our money in various restaurants and uh, sites of entertainment. And one of the earliest pages said, there's so much history here that it's almost impossible to absorb. In 1607, these people showed up and began to talk about the colony. And I'm like, okay, this is where we start. And that's where I'm going to start. So, past silences. Most of us began to learn what we know about the past in grade school, not through history courses, but through a hybrid discipline known in Virginia as social studies. The social studies are defined as the integrated study of the social sciences and humanities to promote civic competence. Let's see if this will work. No, it's not going to behave for me. Okay, sorry about that. The assumption is that social studies, because they're called sciences, are based on objective observation and facts rather than subjective interpretation. In the same way, we often imagine history to be an objective analysis of the past, but the truth is our stories about who we are and who we were are grounded within a Western frame of reference. Stories are made of silences. 
What the writers of stories of history believe to matter becomes the narrative, and what they think doesn't matter is excluded. Those who construct the story, therefore, exercise tremendous power, the power conferred by academic authority or by a state or national agenda. In the United States, our national historical narrative centers around the story of European arrival and westward movement. It tends to, ex to include people and events that are seen as integral to the preferred storyline and to exclude or minimize those who aren't. What we've gained, as most of us know, is an intimate understanding of the lives of Europeans and subsequent Americans who were male, white, and wealthy for the most part. What we've lost are the stories of almost everyone else, women, children, poor people, people of color, indigenous peoples, the majority. Other kinds of stories emerge from the cultures of tribal peoples in traditional American Indian and African communities. Stories that show how people came into the world, how to behave, to remember holy places that distinguish the land, places touched by spirit, how to avoid mistakes of all kinds, how to find beauty, how to reciprocate, how to think in balance. These stories are rarely linear. Tribal peoples often construct time as cyclical and believe that human beings do not progress but repeat. They imagine themselves in relation to the world around them, not as separated by a man versus nature dichotomy. In societies with strong oral traditions, people have always valued their orators, storytellers, griots, the keepers of wisdom, faith, and law, those who are careful not to omit what they themselves had been taught by their elders. Within these societies, civic responsibility was embedded and codified in oral narrative and transmitted from one generation to the next through stories. When Europeans arrived on this continent, they brought their assumptions with them. They named things that already had names, writing over the continent's indigenous story, transforming the oral narrative with their discoveries, creating categories in which indigenous and enslaved people became others. They dispossessed African peoples of their histories and cultural knowledge by removing them from their places of origin. They called inhabited land virgin wilderness and created the doctrine of discovery which justified their claims to land. They interpreted humanity in terms of a dichotomy, civilized versus barbarian, and they applied the theory of social Darwinism to human evolution. The stories of tribal peoples began to appear in museums of natural history with dinosaurs, animals, and insects rather than in history museums with stories of human beings. Another dichotomy delineated the beginning of history as the moment of European arrival, preceded by prehistory. Because prehistory has no written narrative, thousands of years of human presence in this place and in others was minimized. We can think of history in this case as the covering of ancient oral texts by writing over them, the burial of historical sites by building on top of them. We call it the Americas. As a result, the majority of Americans became invisible, and the national narrative was constructed without their perspectives and experiences or their consent. The notion of objective history created a narrative in passive voice. Words, words were manipulated, often unconsciously, when applied to people who were considered other. Words like extinct, disappeared, vanished. Anthropological notions about cultural isolation and contact inserted identity markers like authentic and full blood, suggesting that native peoples are now not as real as they were in the past. Euphemistic language celebrated European accomplishments, discovery, not conquest, battles, not massacres. Other forms of linguistic manipulation simplified tribal peoples and their life ways. Villages, not towns. Gardens, not agriculture. Survival skills, not science. Legends or myths, but not history. Words like savage, like lore. Indigenous peoples appeared in past tense, even in Virginia's standards of learning, until 2008, that is. They lived in wigwams, hunted deer, wore buckskin, 
as though all of the indigenous people had died or disappeared, and a native person in a suit and tie couldn't be a real Indian. The overall effect suggested that some people are naturally superior to others, more civilized, smarter, more successful, and resulted in race-based ideologies from which American society is still reeling today. If the purpose of social studies is to create civic competence in Virginia's students, then we must ask ourselves to what degree we've succeeded. Are we educating a public that remains unaware of the experiences of most of the people who populated America's past? How can we change those stories we think we know to make them more inclusive, more complete, and what will we lose if we don't? We can ask ourselves who decides what is momentous and why. In our historical narrative, does an imagined national destiny foreshadow the sequence of events? Who invented democracy, free enterprise, cultural pluralism? Did these ideas exist before Euro Europeans arrived? And if so, in what forms? What kinds of American myths do we package for public consumption? Pocahontas, the first Thanksgiving, who owns the story and who has a stake in its telling? How do sites that interpret our shared history communicate their messages to Virginians and to visitors? Was it really a new world? And if so, to whom? The past is not history. It is all of what happened, not some of what some have said happened. For all of us, truth lies not in being faithful to a view of what mattered but in confronting the present as it represents the past and in examining current injustices. If we want a history that is closer to the truth, we need to create and recreate our stories in the present. We must suffuse them with new layers of meaning. We must revise our narratives, inserting absent voices. We must seek words that resist erasure. Thanks very much. <laughs>